of the Everglades and northwest of Big Lake Okeechobee, this is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters. Today is Friday. It is September the 25th, 2015. It's the first Friday of autumn 2015 and just three months to Christmas. Now we got something to look forward to. Hey, hope you had a good week and are ready for some Far Out Radio. Tim Swartz is back with us this evening. Tim is our resident expert of high strangeness. We always enjoy mind melding with Tim because if there's something strange and unusual, he's into it. This is Tim's 41st visit. We're going to talk about something that we first talked about on uh, Tim's second visit with us over two and a half years ago, and that is the strange, very strange story of Admiral Richard E. Byrd's 1947 Operation High Jump Mission. Admiral Byrd's credentials were impeccable. He was a career Navy man, highly decorated, and we'll get into that later because it matters within the context of what we're going to be talking about. And it was his fourth expedition to Antarctica. He was in charge of an all-out armada of Navy ships. Task Force 68 was the name of it. And it included Byrd's command ship, the Icebreaker Northwind, the USS Mount Olympus, an aircraft carrier, the USS Philippine Sea, plus 13 support ships, six helicopters, six flying boats, two seaplane tenders, and 15 other craft, plus 4,000 men. This is a big deal. Now, Bird arrived on December the 31st, 1946, and it was supposed to be a six- to eight-month mission. Yet, by the end of February, he left, and on March the 5th, 1945, he gave a press interview for a Chilean newspaper called the El Mercurio, warning people of an immensely superior force in Antarctica. Now, the terminated mission is not in dispute. Neither is the interview in the El Mercurio. But the story is so over the top that a rational man just has to say, uh, I'd rather not think about that, thank you very much. Well, that's exactly the kind of stuff that we like to talk about here on Far Out Radio. That's why Tim Swartz is with us tonight. Uh, We bring him in for all the good head-scratcher stuff. Tim is very well-versed in this story. In 2007, he published the book, Admiral Byrd's Secret Journey Beyond the Poles. The book is available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format. Tim is our most frequent guest here on Far Out Radio, and you catch up with Tim's previous 40 visits on Far Out Radio by accessing our Far Out Radio YouTube channel. Just go to our website, faroutradio.com, the top right sidebar. Look for that bright colored Far Out Radio Archive shows on YouTube graphic. After you click through, look for the playlist tab and look for Tim Swartz and expand your horizons. And you can also keep up with Tim's writing at conspiracyjournal.com. And if you're a night owl, you'll definitely enjoy Tim and Mike Mott's weekend program. It's on Sunday nights from midnight to 2 a.m. Eastern Time. It's called The Outer Edge Radio. You can just go over to theouteredgeradio.com, and you can enjoy past programs as well as listen live. Tim, welcome back to 4 Out Radio. Hi, thank you, Scott. Uh, Great evening to you, and uh, as always, it's a real pleasure to be on 4 Out Radio. Well, thank you, and your fans are here. (laughs) Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, your fantastic audience. Thank you very much. All right, sit down. That's all right. Yeah, okay, let's see now. We've got uh, pizza and fried chicken, popcorn, and root beer. We had some complaints about the beer, so we switched over to root beer. Now, who would complain about beer? Uh, well, I wasn't complaining. But, uh, you know, maybe you and Mike should try that for your Outer Edge Radio. You know, bring in an audience and, you know, have a little party there at midnight to 2 a.m. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult to do on a Sunday night than it is, say, like a, uh, an early Friday evening. I but it, it is. It's something to consider, though. Before we get into our topic, i got to tell you about how odd it is here in South Central Florida. Okay. At 6 p.m., The sun was shining directly on our little window thermometer, and it said 110 degrees. Now, that wasn't the air temperature. That was the, you know, the the sun shining on the thermometer. But it said 110 degrees. By 7.15, it started pouring rain, and I just checked, and the temperature is now 70. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like a typical day in Florida to me. Uh, Yeah, pretty much. It gets really hot for... Uh, a little bit of time in the uh, mid to late afternoon, and then all of a sudden it clouds up, rains like crazy. Uh, it doesn't last long, but it always knocks the temperature down. 
and making it quite delightful. So, anyway, that's, that's perfect weather for the skunk ape, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> skunk ape, <laughs> skunk ape. I'll, I'll let him know if I. I'll let you know if I see him. Oh, okay. Or smell him. Hmm. Anyway, Admiral Bird, I had uh, I started thinking about this a couple of weeks ago because I had on uh, history, World War II historian Harry Cooper, hmm. and Harry Cooper has been on to this story about Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun and a lot of other high-ranking German uh, Nazis escaping. They went to South America, and I asked Harry if he had, was familiar with the Admiral Bird story. He was familiar with it, but not that much. And what's very curious about the Admiral Byrd story, about what they claim he found down there, and this issue of you know, Germans escaping to South America in Argentina, down in the Argentina area, there are places that, well, first of all, it looks just like the Rhineland. It looks like Bavaria. And there's a heck of a lot of blonde-haired, fair-skinned people that sure look like Germans. <laughs> <laughs> and you just got to wonder, you know, like, are you from around here or what, you know? Oh, well, you know, I mean, Argentina was an ally of Nazi Germany up until the very end of the war when all of a sudden uh, 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 Perón uh, joined the Allies. And the reason for that is that uh, once uh, Argentina became uh, went to the side of the Allies, that meant that they could send... Uh, their ships, airplanes, and, you know, anything they had possible, you know, possible over to Germany to, uh, assist in, uh, getting those, uh, high elite Nazi officials and, uh, uh scientists, you know, equipment, whatever they get, you know, money, uh, whatever they could get their hands onto and get them out of, uh, Germany before, especially Russia, you know, before, uh, the Allies, uh, made it into Berlin. You know, from a few years ago, I read Jim Marr's wonderful book called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. One of the many things I came away with was that arguably the biggest spoil of the war was the, the German brain trust. That's why so many of the, of the rocket scientists and, and scientists and engineers uh, that, that worked for the Third Reich uh, were brought here. These guys were just brilliant. Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, you know, of course, that uh, this was uh, also planned by German officials. They wanted this to happen. They realized that the war was lost fairly early on. I mean, oh my gosh, probably as uh, far back as maybe 1943. Uh, and, uh, so they, they very quickly went into operation to do what they could to save themselves, uh, and, uh, really, uh, repurpose the Third Reich, uh, away from Germany. Because, I mean, they realized that, you know, once the Allies won, I mean, they weren't going to, uh, punish Germany like they did after World War One. I. I mean, that would have been, uh, an even greater disaster than World War II. So they realized that if they could get themselves into various locations around the globe, that um, they could still accomplish a lot of the goals that they had been uh, working on uh, while in Germany. So uh, they made sure that the, uh, uh, especially you know, Great Britain and the United States, uh, got a hold of some of the leading and uh, top scientists and that uh, the Soviet Union would get a hold of a lot of the, say, like uh, mid-level uh, managers. That way, neither side would have uh, the complete story, you know, so to speak, and uh, would not, it would take them longer to, to accomplish their goals. Uh, rather than having, you know, like everybody, uh, you know, uh, having both the uh, rocket scientists and the uh, uh, technicians, which, you know, the Soviet Union was able to get a hold of uh, rather than the United States. So I think that was one of the reasons why it took both countries a lot longer to uh, get into the space program, build successful rockets, when Germany was doing it in the 1940s. Well, you know, um, Clark McClellan, I'm sure you're familiar with Clark, mm -hmm. former NASA flight engineer. It's not as ex that wasn't his exact title. I forget what it is, but it's close enough for us laymen. Clark 
worked with a lot of those German engineers. He worked with Warner von Braun. He just knew them as co-workers and colleagues. And, you know, oftentimes I, when he's on with uh, Jeff Rentz or he's on other programs, I hear him talk about these men as being uh, brilliant engineers, nice guys. He liked them a lot. They liked him a lot. And, you know, life goes on, I suppose. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I suppose politics makes uh, for strange uh, bedfellows sometimes. Indeed it does. Yeah. So there was obviously something very, very juicy down in Antarctica, such that they would, such that our government would put together a fourth expedition, huge expedition, you know, 4,000 men and, you know, icebreakers and an aircraft carrier and, and all these support ships. Uh, I was reading about the mission today and they, they, it said that they had done aerial reconnaissance and covered about the amount of area that would be about half that of the United States. They had discovered a whole bunch of new mountain ranges that they didn't know were there. And then all of a sudden, uh, the Admiral said, okay, we're done, let's go. I mean, that's just one of those... Now, when you were researching your book, did you come across anything that explained why did he cut it off after two months? It was supposed to go six to eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's definitely a head scratcher. Uh, you know, uh, some people have um, erroneously attributed uh, the uh, uh, that, that that the weather conditions uh, started to get bad in Antarctica, uh, not realizing that uh, the time of the year that. The uh, Operation High Jump uh, took place was uh, well. I mean, it's, it, it was um, um, Antarctica <laughs> summer, <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, nothing like we we would call summer around here. Right. Uh, but um, you know, it's just uh, uh, nobody uh, really knows. I mean, I have my suspicions, and of course, there has been a lot of uh, uh, of talk that. Operation High Jump was part of a, you know, like a basically a military operation meant to go down a, in search of uh, a secret Nazi uh, base. That uh, it, it was one of the locations that uh, you know the, the the few remaining you know Nazi scientists and officials that did did not want to give themselves up to the Allies didn't want to uh, move to Argentina uh, and instead they uh, uh, camped out at this uh, secret base in Antarctica and, and along with them the, uh, the 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 uber top secret uh, Nazi flying saucers that uh, supposedly um, had been built, uh, especially like in Czechoslovakia and Poland, and was ready to be brought out into, uh, uh, you know, in full force near the end of the war, but they, you know, just a little bit too, you know, too little too late. So, unfortunately, while that story sounds, you know, sounds great, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a sexy story. I mean, boy, I mean, that's something that uh, uh, they should, they should make a movie about it. I mean, that is, that's just perfect movie fodder. But, you know, the, the more research that I have done over the years on this subject, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering more and more if this, if, if this was true. You know, or, or or not. You know, uh, Great Britain actually had set a uh, a military operation to Antarctica. Gosh, I can't remember. Maybe about a year or so before Operation High Jump, and uh, this was written up in Nexus magazine. And uh, you know, according to the author who wrote this book, you know, they they actually were able to make it into the base, and they found it was abandoned at that point. And, uh, so, I mean, if that was the case, it, it would have been some really bad communication, uh, between Great Britain and, uh, the United States. <laughs> that if uh, Great Britain had been there and basically found an abandoned base, then why Operation High Jump? What was the reason for it? Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're really, we're, we're still trying to uncover all of the information about what actually happened there. I mean, you know, there was, uh, as you said in your opening, there was over uh, 4,000 men uh, uh, that, that 
uh, accompanied Operation High Jump. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. And you know, I've I have read there's uh, uh, you know like online biographies uh, that were that were written about this whole operation. And, uh, you know, nobody really has said anything about running into, uh, uh, Nazi flying saucers or aliens or, 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 or hollow earth, uh, uh, expeditions or, or anything like that. There, there, even a documentary, uh, that, uh, that was shot and, uh, actually uh, distributed to uh, movie theaters shortly after the, uh, uh, the operation. Now, granted, the, uh, the grunts who were part of the contingent of Operation High Jump would not have been uh, in on uh, the secret, <laughs> the secret operations of what was going on. You know, only very few of the people at the very uh, uh, top echelon of Operation High Jump knew what exactly was going on. Everybody else, I mean, you know, they, you know, it's a need to it, need to know situation. So, you know, it's, it's not surprising to me that we don't have stories, you know, from, uh, you know, from the, the, the soldiers and, uh, uh, Navy men who, who, who went with them. I mean, they, their chief was concerned, their chief concerned was keeping their, uh, their feet and butts warm <laughs> while they were there. Uh, cause you have to realize that, um, Operation High Jump was cobbled together really fast. The war had been over, World War II had been over uh, maybe about a year, and uh, a lot of, a lot of Navy ships were being de- decommissioned at the time. Right. So it's really odd that uh, all of a sudden there would be this very quick turnaround to bring some of the, uh, a lot, not some, a lot of these ships out of mothballs and to uh, get them up and running again for what was purported to be a scientific exploration of Antarctica. You're going to take an aircraft carrier for a scientific uh, photo expedition. Exactly. Airplanes and, and, you know, 4,700 men. That's a lot of people. I mean, you think about the logistics of having to, to, to feed and take care of that many people on what, uh, you know, something that could have been accomplished if it were actually was a scientific expedi- expedition. Yeah, something plus, that could have been done in, with just, you know, uh, God, more than half or less than half of yeah, that plus, amount of personnel. Plus carrying all your own fuel. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, you know, this, uh, you know, you talk about, uh, uh, sailing off, uh, the edge of the world. I mean, you know, you can't really get any further away, uh, than, than that. I think, uh, gosh, what is it? Is it, uh, New Zealand maybe or maybe South Africa are the only two closest? And, you know, we'll put, uh, quotation marks <laughs> around that word closest. Uh, when it comes to, you know, going to Antarctica. So, I mean, you know, we're talking about something that, um, it's an oddity. I don't know if there has ever been, um, a military, civilian, whatever you want to call it, scientific operation, uh, like Operation High Jump in the past, uh, that, that, that I can think of. It's, it, it definitely is, uh, an, an oddity. Now, we got a commercial coming up in about a minute, so I just want to squeeze this in, because on the <laughs> other side, what, I, what I'd like you to do is to share with us the wild story. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to point out that Admiral Byrd was a career Navy man. This was his fourth expedition. He was also one of the most highly decorated officers in the history of the Navy. He's probably the only individual to receive the Medal of Honor, the Navy Cross, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Silver Life-Saving Medal. And he also received all three Antarctic Expedition Medals issued for the expeditions prior to World War II. Mm -hmm. Uh, This was a a very serious fellow. He was a Mason. Interestingly, he was a Mason out of, let's see, the lodge was in Washington, D.C. Ah, yes. He was a member of the Federal Lodge Number no. One hmm. in Washington, D.C., and he joined on March the 19th, 1921. <laughs> and Byrd and his co pilot had dropped Masonic flags over both the North and the South Poles. I'd say that's a serious Mason. 
and a very <laughs> serious guy. Tim, we have our music playing, so we're going to take our break for our listeners. If you're just joining us, Tim Swartz is our guest this evening, talking about Admiral Richard E. Byrd's Operation High Jump. You can get really get into this in Tim's book, Admiral Byrd's Secret Journey Beyond the Poles. It's available on Amazon in print and in Kindle format. And we'll be right back. Tim Swartz playing some blues, eating some popcorn and some fried chicken and root beer. <laughs> root beer. <laughs> I think maybe Tim has got the real beer, but anyway. <laughs> we're talking about Admiral Richard E. Byrd's Operation High Jump, truly one of the strangest military operations in American history. Now, where would you like to begin here, Tim, with the press conference and what he had to say, or do you want to start off with the wild story? Well, uh, now it, uh, you know, it all depends what you mean by the wild story because there are a lot of wild stories that are associated with ho- Operation High Jump. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I think that we should definitely bring out is, uh, starting sometime in the, probably the early 1950s, a, a manuscript started circulating, uh, called The Secret Diary of Admiral Byrd. And this was supposedly the, uh, the, the notes that Bird was taken when he was on a secret plane flight over the, uh, the North Pole of the Arctic in, uh, 1947. Uh, in this, uh, in this manuscript, he writes how his plane was accosted by, uh, flying saucers that had Nazi insignia on them, and they were taken to a hidden city inside of the earth. Uh, in this city, they, uh, they met with the inhabitants of the hollow earth, uh, and, uh, a story very similar to a lot of the, uh, the early uh, UFO contactee stories, uh, where uh, the leader of this group told Bird and his navigator that, uh, the, they were fearful of the uh, atomic bomb testing that was going on on the surface of the planet. But not only, uh, could it have devastating effects on those of us on the surface, uh, but, uh, you know, screw up the lives of, uh, those who, uh, who live in the, uh, the inner world as well. Uh, the interesting thing about this uh, story and this manuscript is that at the same time that you know supposedly Byrd was making these the secret uh, expedition to the Arctic, he was actually involved in Operation High Jump. So it's uh, it, it, it it's always left me wondering whether or not this manuscript was disinformation that had been deliberately released in order to draw attention away uh, from the controversy that resulted from Operation Hijab. Uh Because uh, as, uh, as we had mentioned earlier, High Jump was supposed to last a number of months, and it barely lasted, I think it was what, six weeks, I think is what it was, uh, before they uh, they gathered everything up and, and came back. On their way back, uh, Bird talked to uh, reporters who were uh, along uh, with this expedition. Uh, the, you mentioned the one newspaper, uh, the, the El Mercurial, I think is how it's pronounced. And he said that, uh, uh, you know, Western powers really had to worry about, uh, you know, enemy aircraft uh, attacking us uh, by coming over the poles. 
which uh, and and then you know as when he came back he also uh, uh said the same thing to a special uh, uh um senate subcommittee uh he uh, he had a a secret talk before congress and oddly enough uh the uh, um, uh james forrestal who was the um the the secretary of defense at the time of the United States, uh, had to be institutionalized because he started having panic attacks and was actually seen running down the corridors of the Pentagon shouting, uh, they're, they're, they're here. They're going to, you know, kill us. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, Forrestal eventually ended up committing, and we'll put quotation marks around this, committing suicide. So we're left to wonder. What is the truth and what is disinformation around uh, Operation High Jump and uh, uh, Byrd's reports after he came back? Now, if we are talking about just a purely, you know, scientific or even a even a military operation, because uh, there were stories that Operation High Jump was was an attempt to kind of secure Antarctica for the United States, uh, which would have been, you know. Uh, you know, in the, in the eyes of uh, other countries in the world, this this would not have been a good thing. It, it would have been a political it would have been a political disaster because you know the Arctic Antarctica is supposed to be you know, kind of like the moon. It's uh, you know, it, it's supposed to be free of uh, control from uh, really from any country. Oh, and, I know one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so if uh, the United States was using Operation High Jump to uh, kind of secure the high ground, so to speak, that uh, that would have been a, uh, a very good thing in the eyes of, say, you know, like the U.N. or the Soviet Union or anybody like that. Some of the other stories, like I mentioned before, was that, uh, you know, Nazi uh, personnel, the elite, uh, uh, who had uh, fled to South America had started rumors that there was a secret base in Antarctica and that not everybody who uh, escaped from Germany, you know, ended up in, uh, in South America and that some of these people, uh, along with some uh, very exotic technology, had uh, established a base in, uh, uh, in Antarctica. And I, you know, I wonder, Scott, whether or not this may have been a disinformation campaign uh, from the Nazis as well to try to uh, draw attention away from uh, uh, what they were actually doing in in South America, because you know the uh, the, the Perón administration was uh, very eager to develop them for themselves some of this exotic technology that the Nazis were working on. I mean, you know, we're, ta we're talking about uh, the the atomic bomb, uh, and as well as uh, the uh, Der Glocken, you know, the Bell technology. Uh, so it had the flying wing down there too. Exactly, the Horton brothers uh, had uh, had who had developed the flying wing had made it to to South America. So you know it uh, it may have been a very clever ploy on the, uh, 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 the the entrenched Nazis in South America to try to draw uh, uh, America away from looking there and instead go kind of like on a wild goose chase to Antarctica. It's also worth mentioning that. Antarctica is very far away from Argentina. It's not close. I mean, we no. tend to think of everything below the equator as being kind of sort of close. It's not. <laughs> I forget how many miles it is from Argentina to Antarctica, but it's a long, long way off. And, uh, you know, I, maybe you could imagine some, uh, some, uh, you know, high ranking former SS officers, uh, having a beer at one of those pubs, laughing it up at the Americans who are chasing them down in, Antarctica. <laughs> well, now we do. We do have. I mean, uh, it, it 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 was proven. Uh, I mean, we know this for a fact that uh, several Nazi uh, U-boats uh, gave themselves up uh, at Antarctica, and they they arrived uh, completely empty. And according to their um, their onboard records, uh, they left. Uh, um, South Africa 
fully loaded. And then they show up empty. So now, where did the people and the, you know, other items of interest that they had on board go to, if not a possible secret base in Antarctica? Hmm. One of those hmm things. Hmm, yes. Things that make you go hmm. That's right. Alrighty, we got our music playing, so we're going to take our commercial break. And uh, Tim Swartz is with us this evening. We're talking about the high strange story of the uh, Admiral Byrd expedition called Operation High Jump uh, down to south or uh, down to the very bottom of the Earth, South Pole, Antarctica. It's a wild story. We'll pick it up on the other side of the break. Be right back. Welcome back to Far Out Radio. We're having a good time tonight. Tim Swartz is with us. During the commercial break, I, I thought I'd go over and uh, see if I could get some chicken. It's all gone. It's all gone. Oh, they drank no. all the beer, or the root beer, that is. Already? Already, it's all gone. Ugh. During the uh, Seriously, though, during the break, I found an interesting uh, portion of the 19, March 5th, 1947, Chilean newspaper El Mercurio article. Uh, that we were referencing, and it says, this is rather short, and it says this, Admiral Richard E. Byrd warned today that the United States should adopt measures of protection against the possibility of an invasion of the country by hostile planes coming from the polar regions. The Admiral explained that he was not trying to scare anyone, but the cruel reality is that in case of a new war, the United States could be attacked by planes flying over one or both poles. Hmm. The statement was made as part of a recapitulation of his own polar experience, an exclusive interview with International News Service. Talking about the recently completed expedition, it was not completed, Byrd said that the most important result of his observations and discoveries is the potential effect that they have in the relation to security of the United States. The fantastic speeds with which the world is shrinking, recalled the Admiral, is one of the most important lessons learned during this recent Antarctic exploration. I have to warn my compatriots that the time has ended when we are able to take refuge in our isolation and rely on the certainty that the distances, the oceans, and the poles were a guarantee of safety. Mm. Unquote. Mm. He was genuinely... Concerned, frightened, scared. What's really interesting, I think, Scott, is that at that time, no country that we know of had the aerial capability to do that. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's like you, it's, it's like you said in the, uh, our last segment, uh, Antarctica, you know, everyone thinks that, uh, uh say like uh, Argentina and South America are fairly close to Antarctica. Well, they're not. Nothing is that close. So in order to have the capability to fly, uh, over the, uh, the top or the bottom of the earth to, uh, to attack the United States, that was completely outside of, uh, the realm of possibility of, of, of every country that we know of at that time. Now, what do we know about the fellow who was publishing the Bird manuscript? What I have been told, and uh, uh, and this uh, and this came from uh, Timothy Green Beckley, uh, actually, who, who who dealt with this person, and and you have to forgive me, Scott, I cannot remember his name at the moment. <laughs> this the the guy who was publishing the manuscript was a Hollow Earth enthusiast, and uh, Beckley told me that uh, he received this uh, manuscript from a um, an unknown source from Washington, D.C. 
So it sounds, you know, to me it sounds very much like what we saw happen, say, like in the 1980s with these uh, alleged government and uh, military whistleblowers who were uh, uh, approaching uh, UFO investigators, say, like uh, Linda Moulton Howell and people mm-hmm. like that, you know, with uh, saying that they had the inside story on the reality of, uh, of, of UFOs and the extraterrestrial creatures that uh, – were, you know, uh, uh, flying them and had uh, signed a secret uh, treaty with the United States. You mean the Richard Doty types? Exactly, exactly. Uh, well, there, were a and, lot of, there was a lot of that going on. Poor Linda. Here yeah, she I know. She, here she thought she had a really good inside source, and that guy was just playing her. Well, there were uh, there were uh, a number of uh, uh, UFO investigators. You know, Timothy Good from London. You know, he the same thing happened to him. Uh, I mean, he he received the MJ twelve documents. Uh, he says, you know, a couple months before uh, uh, Linda Moulton Howell was approached with it. So I think that I mean, we we are seeing with the whole uh, secret diary of Admiral Byrd and uh, uh, some of these uh, more incredible stories uh, coming out, uh, an early attempt at uh, uh, disinformation uh, using uh, UFOs in in order to draw draw attention away with uh, what might actually had uh, have been going on and, uh, and and I should note also that uh, I'm beginning to wonder more and more now if the operation high jump uh, expedition ended early because once they got there and got to the location that supposedly this uh, Nazi base was that they found either nothing or an old base that had been uh, abandoned a long time ago. That's a tantalizing notion to chew on. However, didn't they go there to do aerial exploration and reconnaissance? Which they did. You know, they did some. Uh, but but according to uh, uh, some uh, uh, researchers, uh, you know, and of course these are, you know, researchers who are you know, looking at the whole thing, you know, years after the fact, that the entire operation was ill-conceived and poorly planned uh, from the beginning. And mm-hmm. that, uh, uh, but, you know, I should also note that, you know, Robert Morningstar, he sent me a picture that uh, of a, uh, uh, what is claimed to be an atomic blast in the very same area that uh, Operation High Jump was uh, supposedly looking for this uh, uh, Nazi base. And, wow. I mean, yeah, yeah. In 1968, there was uh, a several atomic blasts allegedly uh, in Antarctica, an area that uh, was uh, supposed to be off limits for those kinds of uh, uh, nuclear testing. Uh, so, I, 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 you know, I find that extremely interesting and, and compelling. Well, if you wanted to go somewhere where not too many people are looking, <laughs> that's a good place to go. But, you know, you have to think about, though, uh, one of the problems with uh, uh, putting a base up, or, or at least a large base in, in, say, like Antarctica, is that you have to power it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'd, unless they had, you know, like some, like, a, you know, had discovered a, a fairly rich resource, say, like coal or, or, or something along those lines, how were they able to, uh, to, to, to power a base in, in Antarctica? You know, I mean, we're, we're left with a lot of information and an even more, uh, uh, we're left with even more questions. So, I mean, it, it it's just, you know, every day, you know, it, it seems like every day, Scott, that uh, that I run across something new when it comes to this whole story that just makes me scratch my head. And, you know, it's like, gosh, am I going to have to start all over again, you know, with my research on this? Because, you know, just when you think that maybe you have your finger on uh, on some kind of literal truth about this uh, story, something new comes up and you just kind of like, you know, throw your hands up in the air and say, ah, I give up. <laughs> you know, a couple of months ago, I was listening to Jay, researcher and filmmaker Jay Widener was, uh, when I was talking with Jeff Rents, and he made an interesting comment that I've just sort of been stewing on. And basically what he said was that I'm beginning to wonder if everything from about the end of World War II, all the cultural events and the you know, the hippie movements and all the, all the things that have unfolded since that time hasn't been one big psyop. 
<laughs> you know, psychological yeah. operation with the intention of social engineering. Because when you start digging into a lot of these things, there are there are just more and more things that don't add up, that don't make any sense. And it just seems that the more you look into things that we all took for granted, you know, the JFK assassination, Bobby Kennedy's assassination, the moon landing, and there's just, it's all inconclusive, but the more we look, the bigger the pile of things that we find that just don't add up. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> I like that. I like that. That, uh, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and, uh, for example, look at a lot of the, uh, uh famous musicians from the 1960s. Oh, the uh, whole Laurel Canyon scene thing is just exactly, too, too you know, I, I, practically every one of them had a military connection in their yeah. family one way or the other. And back in those days, those fellows were, were ripe. For the draft, and none of them got drafted. Okay. And and, the, and the, their drug use was very open and out in the public. It was no secret. Uh, not hardly any of them got busted. The only guy that got into serious trouble was uh, David Crosby, and that's because right. he had a gun <laughs> and drugs <laughs> with him. He ended up going to jail for that. But uh, yeah, so a lot of that stuff that just flat out doesn't add up. But then on the other hand, you know, I just, I came across a news story from earlier this year. Lake Vostok breakthrough. Russian scientists drill clean hole into the Antarctic subglacial basin. There is something down there that is very, very tantalizing and interesting. And perhaps one day we'll find out, and we'll be talking about it here on Far Out Radio. I can't wait. To, I can't wait to get that information. Who do you have coming up on uh, on the uh, the Outer Edge Radio this weekend? Well, this uh, this Sunday we're going to be talking to uh, Linda Godfrey. You know about the whole, uh, uh, you know, Bray Road uh, uh, werewolf and uh, other cryptid creatures uh, uh, around the planet. Uh, it should be an absolutely fascinating conversation because I just, you know, I love cryptid creature stories. <laughs> well, sometimes I do stay up late, and I'll have to tune in. Oh, please do, Tim. Thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate it, buddy. Well, thank you, Scott. I had a great time, and uh, I hope your audience enjoyed it as well. Always good to connect with you, and we'll talk again soon. All right. That is our program for this evening. Hey, have a great weekend and uh, get some downtime, a little relaxation time. Do some blue sky daydreaming. Look at the clouds for a little bit. It's good for you. We'll be back next week with more Far Out Radio. of an immensely superior force in Antarctica. Now, the terminated mission is not in dispute. Neither is the interview in the El Mercura. But the story is so over the top that a rational man just has to say, uh, I'd rather not think about that, thank you very much. Well, that's exactly the kind of stuff that we like to talk about here on Far Out Radio. That's why Tim Swartz is with us tonight. Uh, we bring him in for all the good head-scratcher stuff. Tim is very well-versed in this story. In 2007, he published the book, Admiral Byrd's Secret Journey Beyond the Poles. The book is available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format. Tim is our most frequent guest here on Far Out Radio, and you catch up with Tim's previous 40 visits on Far Out Radio by accessing our Far Out Radio YouTube channel. Just go to our website, faroutradio.com, the top right sidebar. Look for that bright colored Far Out Radio Archive shows on YouTube graphic. After you click through, look for the playlist tab and look for Tim Swartz and expand your horizons. You can also keep up with Tim's writing at conspiracyjournal.com. And if you're a night owl, you'll definitely enjoy Tim and Mike Mott's weekend program. It's on Sunday nights from midnight to 2 a.m. Eastern Time. It's called The Outer Edge Radio. You can just go over to theouteredgeradio.com, and you can enjoy past programs as well as listen live. Tim, welcome back to 4 Out Radio. Hi. Thank you, Scott. Uh, great evening to you, and uh, as always, it's a real pleasure to be on 4 Out Radio. Well, thank you, and your fans are here. <laughs> uh, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic audience. Thank you very much. All right, sit down. That's all right. Yeah, okay, let's see now. We've got uh, pizza and fried chicken, popcorn, and root beer. We had some complaints about the beer, so we switched over to root beer. Now, who would complain about beer? Uh, well, I wasn't complaining. But, uh, you know, maybe you and Mike should try that for your Outer Edge Radio. You know, bring in an audience and, you know, have a little party there at midnight to 2 a.m. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult to do on a Sunday night than it is, say, like a uh, an early Friday evening. I but that, it, it is it's something to consider, though. Before we get into our topic, i got to tell you about how odd it is here in South Central Florida. Okay. At 6 p.m., the sun was shining directly on our little window thermometer, and it said 110 degrees. Now, that wasn't the air temperature. That was the... You know, the, the sun shining on the thermometer. But it's at 110 degrees. By 7.15, it started pouring rain, and I just checked, and the temperature is now set. Life goes on, I suppose. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I suppose politics makes uh, for strange uh, bedfellows sometimes. Indeed it does. Yeah. So there was obviously something very, very juicy down in Antarctica, such that they would, such that our government would put together a fourth expedition, huge expedition, you know, 4,000 men and, you know, icebreakers and an aircraft carrier and, and all these support ships. Uh, I was reading about the mission today and they, they, it said that they had done aerial reconnaissance and covered about the amount of area that would be about half that of the United States. They had discovered a whole bunch of new mountain ranges that they didn't know were there. And then all of a sudden, uh, the Admiral said, okay, we're done, let's go. I mean, that's just one of those... Now, when you were researching your book, did you come across anything that explained why did he cut it off after two months? It was supposed to go six to eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's definitely a head scratcher. Uh, you know, uh, some people have um, erroneously attributed uh, the uh, 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 that, that that the weather conditions uh, started to get bad in Antarctica, uh, not realizing that uh, the time of the year that the uh, Operation High Jump uh, took place was uh, well, I mean, it, it, it was. Um, um, Antarctica <laughs> summer, <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, nothing like we we would call summer around here. Right. Uh, but um, you know, it's just uh, uh, nobody uh, really knows. I mean, I have my suspicions, and of course, there has been a lot of uh, uh, of talk that Operation High Jump was part of a, you know, like a, basically a, a military operation meant to go down a, in search of uh, a secret Nazi uh, base that uh, it, it was one of the locations that, uh, you know, the, the, the few remaining, you know, Nazi scientists and officials that didn't, did not want to give themselves up to the Allies, didn't want to uh, move to Argentina, uh, and instead they uh, uh, camped out at this uh, secret base in Antarctica. And, and along with them, the, uh, the, the, the uber-top secret uh, Nazi flying saucers, that uh, supposedly um, had been built, uh, especially like in Czechoslovakia. Everglades and northwest of Big Lake Okeechobee. This is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters. Today is Friday. It is September the 25th, 2015. It's the first 
Friday of autumn 2015 and just three months to Christmas. Now we got something to look forward to. Hey, hope you had a good week and are ready for some Far Out Radio. Tim Swartz is back with us this evening. Tim is our resident expert of high strangeness. We always enjoy mind melding with Tim because if there's something strange and unusual, he's into it. This is Tim's 41st visit. We're going to talk about something that we first talked about on uh, Tim's second visit with us over two and a half years ago, and that is the strange, very strange story of Admiral Richard E. Byrd's 1947 Operation High Jump mission. Admiral Byrd's credentials were impeccable. He was a career Navy man, highly decorated, and we'll get into that later because it matters within the context of what we're going to be talking about. And it was his fourth expedition to Antarctica. He was in charge of an all-out armada of Navy ships. Task Force 68 was the name of it. And it included Byrd's command ship, the Icebreaker Northwind, the USS Mount Olympus, an aircraft carrier, the USS Philippine Sea, plus 13 support ships, six helicopters, six flying boats, two seaplane tenders, and 15 other craft, plus 4,000 men. This is a big deal. Now, Bird arrived on December the 31st, 1946, and it was supposed to be a six- to eight-month mission. Yet, by the end of February, he left, and on March the 5th, 1945, he gave a press interview for a Chilean newspaper called the El Mercuro, warning people uh, that, that worked for the Third Reich uh, were brought here. These guys were just brilliant. Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, you know, of course, that uh, this was uh, also planned by German officials. They wanted this to happen. They realized that the war was lost fairly early on. I mean, oh my gosh, probably as uh, far back as maybe 1943. Uh, and uh, so they, they very quickly went into operation to do what they could to save themselves uh, and uh, really uh, repurpose the Third Reich uh, away from Germany. Because, I mean, they realized that, you know, once the Allies won, I mean, they weren't going to uh, punish Germany like they did after World War One. I. I mean, that would have been uh, an even greater disaster than World War Two. So they realized that if they could get themselves into various locations around the globe, that um, they could still accomplish a lot of the goals that they had been uh, working on uh, while in Germany. So uh, they made sure that the, uh, uh, especially, you know, Great Britain and the United States uh, got a hold of some of the leading and uh, top scientists and that uh, the Soviet Union would get a hold of a lot of the, say, like uh, mid-level uh, managers. That way, neither side would have uh, the complete story, you know, so to speak, and uh, would not. It would take them longer to to accomplish their goals, uh, rather than having, you know, like everybody, uh, you know, having both the uh, rocket scientists and the uh, technicians which, you know, the Soviet Union was able to get a hold of uh, rather than the United States. So I think that was one of the reasons why it took both countries a lot longer to uh, get into the space program, build successful rockets, when Germany was doing it in the 1940s. Well, you know, um, Clark McClellan, I'm sure you're familiar with Clark, mm -hmm. former NASA flight engineer. It's not as ex That wasn't his exact title. I forget what it is, but it's close enough for us laymen. Clark worked with a lot of those German engineers. He worked with Warner von Braun. He just knew them as co-workers and colleagues. And, you know, oftentimes I, when he's on with uh, Jeff Rentz or he's on other programs, I hear him talk about these men as being uh, brilliant engineers, nice guys. He liked them a lot. They liked him a lot. And, you know, 70. <laughs> Sounds like a typical day in Florida to me. Uh, yeah, pretty much. It gets really hot for a, a little bit of time in the uh, mid to late afternoon, and then all of a sudden it clouds up, rains like crazy. Uh, it doesn't last long, but it always knocks the temperature down, uh, making it quite delightful. So, anyway. That's, that's perfect weather for the skunk ape, you know. Oh, oh yeah. Skunk ape. Skunk ape. 
Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll let him know if I. I'll let you know if I see him. Oh, okay. Or, or smell him. Hmm. Anyway, Admiral Byrd, I had uh, I started thinking about this a couple of weeks ago because I had on um, history, World War II historian Harry Cooper. Mm-hmm. And Harry Cooper has been on to this story about Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun and a lot of other high-ranking German uh, Nazis escaping. They went to South America. And I asked Harry if he had, was familiar with the Admiral Byrd story. He was familiar with it, but not that much. And what's very curious about the Admiral Byrd story, about what they claim he found down there, and this issue of you know, Germans escaping to South America in Argentina, down in the Argentina area, there are places that, well, first of all, it looks just like the Rhineland. It looks like Bavaria. And there's a heck of a lot of blonde-haired, fair-skinned people that sure look like Germans. <laughs> <laughs> and you just got to wonder, you know, like, are you from around here or what, you know? Oh, well, you know, I mean, Argentina was an ally of Nazi Germany up until the very end of the war when all of a sudden uh, 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 Perón uh, joined the Allies. And the reason for that is that uh, once uh, Argentina became uh, went to the side of the Allies, that meant that they could send uh, their ships, airplanes, and you know anything they had possible you know, possible over to Germany to uh, assist in uh, getting those uh, high elite Nazi officials and uh, uh, scientists, you know, equipment, whatever they you know money. Uh, whatever they could get their hands onto and get them out of uh, Germany before, especially Russia, you know, before uh, the Allies uh, made it into Berlin. You know, from a few years ago, I read Jim Marr's wonderful book called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. One of the many things I came away with was that arguably the biggest spoil of the war was the, the German brain trust. That's why so many of the of the rocket scientists and, and scientists and engineers 